is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hi, this is Tim Hoyer from 180 Coaching, and you're listening to Hoop Heads Podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. I have to change. I can't coach like this. I can't be like, I'm never a big yeller or screamer, but I can be pretty intense. And I said, I got, I got to change. And next day had a meeting with my guys, apologized to them and just said, guys, that's not the coach I want to be for you guys. That's not the kind of coach I want to model. And I said, from this point on, I said, I'm not going to yell at you guys. Here's the standards. Here's the expectations. And if you don't want to meet them, then you just won't participate. I'm not going to yell and scream at you guys to get you to do what I think you need to be doing. Is like I want you to find that motivation within you intrinsically. Shane Soudon is the men's head basketball coach at Briarcrest College in Saskatchewan, Canada. He is also part of the Thrive on Challenge mentorship team and hosts the Culture Builders podcast in support of the mission at Thrive on Challenge. Shane grew up playing a variety of sports and ended up focusing on basketball and baseball in high school which led to a baseball scholarship opportunity at Northwestern State University in Louisiana. After university, he was offered a varsity boys basketball head coaching position back in his hometown, so he moved back home after graduation to begin his coaching and teaching career. After his fifth season coaching high school ball, Soudon was asked to take over a struggling women's basketball program at Briarcrest College. After four seasons, he resigned and went back to coaching and teaching at the high school level, where he spent the next seven years as a teacher, administrator, and coach. At that point, Soudon felt the desire to get back into the college game and was hired to take over the men's program at Briarcrest College, where he has been since 2018. Our Hoop Heads Pod webinar series gives you access to some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com webinars to get registered. The trailer for Thrive with Trevor Huffman, the first show from our newly created Hoop Heads Podcast Network, is available now for you to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thrive with Trevor Huffman will take you into the lives, minds, habits, and routines of the world's best and brightest to help you improve your performance. Make sure you check it out. Grab a pen and paper so you're prepared to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Shane Soudon, head men's basketball coach at Briarcrest College, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast head men's basketball coach at Briarcrest College in Canada, Shane Soudon. Shane, welcome to the podcast. Hey guys, good to be here. We are excited to have you on, get a chance to dig into the varied experiences you've had in the game of basketball and in athletics in general. Let's go back in time to when you were a kid Talk to me a little bit about your athletic background, how you got into basketball. We also know that you were a college baseball player. So just kind of go through your childhood sports experience for us. Oh, man. Uh, Yeah, ever since I remember, I think, you know, probably the the oldest story I have is my dad saying as soon as I could walk, I was picking up a ball. Um, You know, didn't matter what sport it was. It was uh, picking up a ball, picking up, you know, those big red plastic bats, um, you know, playing in the backyard, running around, all that sorts of things. So. You know, ever since I was young, very attracted to sports, playing them all the time. That's all I wanted to do, wanted to watch it, wanted to play it. You know, read. that's basically how I learned how to read, you know, reading the back of sports cards in the, the sports <laughs> section in the newspaper. Um, you know, I missed, missed that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so growing up, mostly played every sport I could get my hand on. 
Um, just wanted to try everything, gravitated towards basketball and baseball um, as I got older. And those were kind of the two sports, you know, loved the most, which is maybe a little different being here in Canada. You know, all my friends played hockey. Um, I wasn't the best skater. Um, you know, I was bigger than a lot of them, but you put me on a pair of skates and um, I couldn't do too much. So <laughs> the, the, the field and the, the, and the court were a lot more, a lot more fun, more conducive to my skill set and just, uh, yeah, I was always playing whatever season it was, you know, fall, it was football, winter, it was street hockey, ice hockey, um, you know, basketball clubs, baseball in the, in the spring and summer. It was just, uh, but yeah, as I, as I got older, um, kind of settled on basketball and baseball in high school and really focused on those, those two sports, played volleyball as well. And, um, yeah, those are my two, two loves, I guess, um, followed them passionately and then just went had the opportunity uh to you know go play either baseball or basketball at the college level and it just came down to choosing i wanted to play at the highest level possible and um had more offers to go play baseball so ended up choosing that path but yeah ever since i was young just sports have been a huge part of my life our family's life and you know our family vacations were taken following me around playing sports and so (laughs) um yeah that's kind of it in a nutshell all right two questions so you mentioned about looking at the statistics in the newspaper, which obviously people of our generation did a lot of, and that doesn't exist anymore. But I always think about with my own kids, one of the things that I think about when it comes to whether it's reading statistics in the newspaper or reading the back of baseball or basketball cards, one of the things in math that I was always amazed at when I was a kid, and I continue to be amazed at kids today, is I learned how to do percentages from calculating basketball players' free throw and field goal percentage, and then baseball players' batting averages. And so you could tell me what's five out of eight, what percentage is that? And I would know simply because of sports, not because I was interested in the math piece of it. So did you find when you were a kid that you were able to quickly calculate percentages just based on your time spent with a box score in the newspaper? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I can totally resonate with that and just brings back so many good memories just even talking about it. And um yeah, I used, I used to be able to time when the newspaper boy was dropping off our paper every day so I could time it, um, and, you know, and you'd memorize those suckers, and then you'll go into the, the corner store just to get, you know, 50, 50 cent baseball, basketball cards with the gum in them, and just memorizing stats, like I can still remember stats, you know, from my favorite, whatever sport it was, you know, how many goals a guy scored a year, how many points Michael Jordan had in 86, you know, like all that kind of stuff you know, and calculating on base percentage, batting averages, field goal percentage, like all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, almost saw that as like that helped help me in my school. Like I loved math up until about probably my junior year of high school right? because <laughs> it was so conducive to just numbers and sports and being numbers based. Absolutely. To follow up on that, could you ever have foreseen a day where you didn't have a newspaper? I always think back to when I was a kid and even on into adulthood, and I would get up in the morning, whether it was before work or before school or whenever, and I'm eating my breakfast, and I was always have the sports page next to me. And as newspapers sort of started to fade away, I would always say, oh, I'm always going to get the newspaper. I can never see a time where I would be sitting and eating my breakfast cereal and have my phone or an iPad next to me. And I was like, ah, that'll, I'll never do that. And what am I doing now? I'm sitting there with my breakfast cereal and my phone or my iPad looking through articles and sports and all the things that I would have looked at in the newspaper. It's just a, such a strange phenomenon to not have that printed media in the same way. It's so different from the way I'm sure you grew up as well. Oh, extremely. And, you know, and I, in, in many ways, I miss it so much. And like, I got three young boys and they're, you know, they're, they're nine, 11 and 13 right now. And, you know, they're into sports and all that. And, it's just a different, um, you know, like they're not looking at the sports cards. They're not looking at the sports page, looking at the stats. And so it's almost like as a father who, who loves that stuff and they're interested in it, it's almost like I got to show them like, here's, here's what we used to read. Here's what this used to look like. Here's how we learned, you know, and like, Hey, here's this basketball card. Look at the back and you can see all these guys stats and how good they were and you know what they did and what they mean. And, um, but back then it was just like, you know, you get the paper, you got the cereal box, you read in the back of the cereal box. Hopefully you're getting some type of toy or card in the cereal <laughs> box as well. Absolutely. And, 
you know, you're you're eating your Cheerios or whatever you're eating, and you're reading the box scores and all the articles you possibly can from from last night. Um, and uh, yeah, like really, really miss that. Honestly, it's a I think it's a lost art, and it's it's really too bad in many ways. Yeah, I agree with you. I miss I miss having my physical paper that I can turn and flip. And clearly, you think about now the ability to find whatever you want on demand and get mm-hmm. scores and get updates and instead of having to wait for the paper and say, I wonder what happened in that late West Coast game. And I, you know, I had to go to bed before it was over and maybe it's not even going to be in the paper the next day. And then how am I going to find out the score of that late game? It's just a totally different world. But I do miss having that physical paper next to me while I'm eating my cereal. Just one of those, again, weird quirks of an old guy like me trying to go back and think about what it was like when I was a kid. Think oh. about when, when you were young and you were collecting cards who was your favorite baseball player? Who was your favorite basketball player? One or two guys that you looked up to that were kind of the people that you were the biggest fans of when you were younger? Well, you know, being being in Canada, you know, the teams I, we follow, you know, the Toronto Blue Jays, of course, so like loved, you know, Roberto Alomar, Joe Carter, John Allrude, you know, was a huge Roger Clemens fan. Um, you know, a lot of people forget he played two years for the Blue Jays. Um you know, uh, Roy Halladay, huge, huge fan of him. And from a basketball standpoint, it's really, really unique. And I think this is what really started. I think I was at first I was a bigger baseball fan growing up and really enjoyed basketball. But then I feel like basketball for a while there, you know, caught up and just started really developing a deeper love for the game. In high school, when we got our cable package up here in up here in Saskatchewan, we we're just above North Dakota. And so we got a couple American channels and we never got ESPN, which when I was down in the States, loved ESPN, my goodness. But I um, missed that, that's for sure. <laughs> it's a whole but, other uh, world, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, the big the big thing was we got our one sports channel we got, we got WGN from Chicago. And so growing up, I watched a ton. Like, So watching The Last Dance right now is just so nostalgic for me because I grew up on the Chicago Bulls. Um, We got every single game of theirs on WGN. And so, you know, from basically 90, oh man, 92, right through, you know, Jordan's second three-year run there, um, watched probably hundreds of Bulls games. You know, like their their intro music still gives me goosebumps. Um, So it's just... You know, and Chicago's pretty far away from where we're at, but so growing up, it was the Blue Jays, and then, you know, honestly, it was the Bulls. I was a huge Charlotte Hornets fan. My favorite player growing up was uh, Larry Johnson. Um, yeah, Larry Johnson. I used to and... shoot like Larry Johnson. I like that. <laughs> there you go. I wish I could dunk like him, man. Yeah, Larry, exactly. He was, uh, I'm, I'm showing my showing my boys and some of my players. Um, yeah, this is who this is who whose poster I had on the wall. Larry Johnson, Sean Kemp, you know, these guys doing crazy things back in the day and just ordered a few... I think I got a few Larry Johnson rookie cards off eBay the other day for like a buck. Um, nice. Got them in the mail and the kid, my boys were like, who's this? I was like, guys, this is who this is. Let's go. <laughs> you know, so start showing them old old clips of Larry Johnson with the Hornets. And, um, you know, so those were kind of, you know, my childhood favorites growing up. Um, still remember Charlotte taking out Boston for their first uh, playoff series win with Lonzo Morning there and everything. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, those were my my teams, my heroes growing up. But yeah, the Bulls WGN was a huge, probably a huge turning point of just so being I have a que- I have a question yeah. in regards to this. So when when the two Canada teams came, did you align yourself with, with Vancouver or Toronto or did you really just kind of stick with what you were accustomed to? I like I like both of them. We're a huge we're you know, most people up here are huge Raptor fans now. You know, and in many ways you can't help it just because I think they're just really well run. But I think it's really unfortunate. Like, um, it's kind of like in baseball, and when, when the Montreal Expos were there, you cheered for the Blue Jays and the Expos because um, they're both like Canada's team. But um, I think the NBA really messed up by getting rid of the Grizzlies because uh, I think they could have been pretty, pretty huge. And uh, Vancouver is a huge hot spot for basketball. And so, yeah, for however many years, five or six years, whatever it is that they were there, it's really, it's kind of like, kind of like Seattle going to Oklahoma City. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah, Vancouver and Vancouver is such an awesome city. Like oh I can't ima- I can't imagine anyone going there and being like 
God, I want, I don't want to live here. This the city. Bryant this, Reese this city. picked it. I'm in, man. I guess, but man, I just like Vancouver is just. It's a beautiful city. It's an international city. Yeah. And I just can't imagine a place where that it being a place where a player would go. And I guess clearly, if you're an American and you have some distaste for being in a foreign country, maybe. But otherwise, I mean, it's just, it's just. I mean, it's beautiful there. I can't imagine anybody going there and being like, "Oh, this place stinks. I wouldn't want to play here." It is, it is un, unreal. Um, you know, just the the city, the, the diversity, the weather. The weather is actually not like like the rest of Canada. <laughs> it's actually really nice. Um, you know, and I watched something. I, I watched like a Steve Nash documentary a couple weeks ago with one of my boys trying to trying to teach them. You know, some you know Steve Nash doesn't seem that old, but he he is um, for my kids, anyways. <laughs> and yep. apparently the Grizzlies could have picked Nash and they jumped over him. Like imagine if he had got picked by the Grizzlies, like oh, man. it just would have been madness up here. Franchise icon. I mean, would have gone down clearly as the all time guy and would have been able to probably keep basketball for sure in Vancouver. I still think there's a chance that at some point, maybe if Seattle comes back in and depending on when I wouldn't be surprised if at some point now it may not be in the next five or 10 years, but I wouldn't be surprised at some point if Vancouver gets another shot at pro basketball. Yeah. I think it's one of the hotbeds that, um, and, and basketball in Canada just itself has exploded in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and so, yeah, I think it'd be, you know, even from a business standpoint, it's, it's almost, I think I can't miss place to have a team right now. Yeah, I agree. I think if you put a team in Seattle, it would make a ton of sense to expand and put a team in Vancouver as well. You just have, you know, you think about it from a travel standpoint, you got Portland and you got Seattle and you got Vancouver all sort of in that general North Pacific Northwest area. I think it'd be, it'd be perfect. You mentioned the last dance. Jason and I have jumped on and done. We did a little recap after each one of the last Sunday nights. So just give me, what was your favorite scene, moment, takeaway, maybe one or two things that were your favorite things that you saw in the documentary? You know, I've done, I've read so much on Michael and the Bulls and everything, you know, and, and Phil and all that. Probably my favorite character that I hadn't maybe, I could say character, you know, player, <laughs> I <had laughs> deep, deep dived into was, was Dennis Rodman. Um, I just, I enjoyed his story. Um, I just think the part that I loved was, you know, he was who he was, love him or hate him, but he was loyal. He loved the game. He relentlessly studied film, and he was a huge piece. And I, I don't, you know, just even seeing him work out after, after games, like you know, just the guy was a absolute machine. And you know, I don't know how if I could have ever coached him, <laughs> but <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I just really, I really enjoyed his his uh, his story so far um and uh yeah that's the one that's the one i've enjoyed the most but yeah there's, there's so many there's so many good snippets i just i just wish they had i would have liked to hear from more of jordan's family members that's the part i would have liked to hear more of it would have been interesting to hear you know that you saw his sons a little bit in the last two episodes and mm-hmm. but we never obviously heard from his ex-wife didn't hear from his current wife at all and yeah it would have been it would have been interesting to to hear their perspective, obviously, his father was such a big thread that ran through that whole entire documentary. Just the impact that his father had on him in the moment while his father was still there with him. And then clearly the inspiration that he provided after he passed away, unfortunately, mm-hmm. and just how Jordan would draw on that emotion from his father's life and then his father's ultimately from his father's death and just the impact that it had on his entire career, I think, was was really telling And then as far as the Rodman stuff goes, I think you're right. One of the things that I found interesting about Rodman is that I think if you put, if you put that version of Dennis Rodman, it's hard to believe that there were too many other situations where you would have a, a coach who would kind of understand and be able to relate to the type of person Rodman was. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's really amazing when you think about the competitor that Jordan was and how much emphasis he put on being the best player at all times, whether it was in a game or in a practice setting, that him and Pippen and the other guys that make up the team were, I don't know if okay was the right word, but that they were able to get past the fact that 
Rodman was able to, I don't know, again, not get away with because he was given permission, but just they understood what Rodman was and wasn't, and they were okay with that. And I don't think that that would have happened in too many other places. No, and like you just hit on so many, like, man, that we could talk for hours on just a few of those main points you just brought up. Like, you know, Jordan's Jordan's relationship with his father, you know, and I think there was so many positive things that helped him be the man he is because of his father. I think both positive and maybe some negative things, right? Some challenges, maybe some father wounds he had, um, you know, and just very telling, you know, with our own players and stuff like that, you know, and then you look at, you look at, um, yeah, Rodman and just, he had to be coached different and in watching, watching that whole situation. I remember all the news stories back in the day, whatever year that was, I can't remember 96 or 97, whatever it was. And hearing about that, you know, I'm, I'm 20, 18, 19 years old at the time and being like, that's crazy. <laughs> then you start like, how could you play with a, like, why would you bolt on your team like that? But then as a, as a coach now, 20 some years later, you know, you'd sit back and be like, man, every single one of the guys on my team is a, they're different. They have different personalities. They have different triggers. They have different ways of connecting with them. Um, and so sometimes everything sometimes can't be the same for every single player on your team. Right. Um, but what does that look like? It's messy. It's hard. Um, and, you know, take some time to in, to engage with that. And so and to develop a culture where, you know, you have to have, I think, s- certain standards for excellence across the board. But then I think there's sometimes just you got to have a little bit of grace depending on certain situations. And I think Phil Jackson was just so tremendous in um, navigating so many egos and personalities. And, um, you know, and then he did it again in L.A., right? Absolutely. Um, so he always had a lot of talent, but I think sometimes that talent wasn't winning until he got there. In a lot of ways, he was ahead of his time because oh, man. you think about what coaching was prior to that or the way that it was thought of was, here's what you're going to do. You're going to do it because I said so. And yeah. if you're not going to do it, here's your punishment. Here's what's going to happen to you. Here's what we're going to take away from you. And I feel Jackson was at the forefront of the idea that being fair doesn't necessarily mean being equal with everybody. And exactly. that, that case with Rodman clearly illustrates that Phil Jackson understood that if he tried to hold Rodman to the same standard as he held Michael Jordan to, it wasn't going to work. And you were going to get nothing from Dennis Rodman. He was going to be gone for your team almost inst- instantaneously. And instead – you have to figure out a way, as you said, to understand each one of your players, understand what their triggers are, understand what it is that they need. And obviously the things that Dennis Rodman needed were a little bit out of the ordinary, but it's kind of amazing that Phil Jackson was able to re- was able to recognize that and that not only was he able to recognize it, but then somehow he was able to convince his other players of why that was okay and why – Dennis was getting to do those things and they weren't not that they even necessarily wanted to do those things, but still I'm sure it took some card, some difficult conversations with those other players to say, look, we have to let Dennis do this if we want to have him at his best when we really need him." And that I'm sure were, those were difficult conversations for Phil Jackson to have. I'm sure. Well, um, it would it would have been interesting just to see like how, how, how many nights, how many weeks did he agonize over decisions like that? Right. Yeah. And, and wrestling through that. And, I guess that's maybe part of the documentary too. Like, you know, Jackson takes over in 89 for a coach who um, Jordan really loved. Like, he really loved Collins. Collins, you know, helped him elevate his game. Um, And it took, what, Phil over a year to get Jordan to buy into a different style of play, a different system, a different mindset. And, you know, the same thing when he went to L.A. So I find, I just find Phil's story so... um, just you know even his book 11 rings like his story is just so fantastic right um and encouraging motivational and so much to learn just on just just dealing with people right working with people well yeah and that speaks so much to what coaching really is and we can all talk about the x's and o's and practice design and all this stuff but especially today i think that those things you can figure those out if you're a hard-working and 
you're somebody who's resourceful, you can go out and you can find, whether it's mentors, whether it's things on the internet, whether it's going to clinics, you can find out about X's and O's and you can figure out how, where to find a bunch of out-of-bounds plays and whatever offense and defensive systems you want to run. Coaches are so willing to share that stuff today that X's and O's to me is so secondary to the ability to manage personalities and people and get everyone rowing that boat in the same direction and making sure everybody's on board. And I think that's something that clearly it comes through in the documentary that Phil Jackson was able to do that with some of, in the case of Jordan, maybe the biggest ego that has ever played the game and rightfully so. But to be able to navigate that just from a human standpoint, I think is probably the most amazing part of it. Well, I think that's the, the probably the most beautiful part of the documentary of what Phil does. It I think it just it's starting it sheds more light on I think a, a, a movement that is growing a bit away from like coaches. I think all coaches like we love X's and O's. We love systems. We wanna we wanna you know implement all that kind of stuff. We wanna learn like we in, in many cases we can't get enough right. And, and we'll pay for it. Right behind me in my office right now, I've got about 50 championship production DVDs, <laughs> right? Um, like, we'll fork out big bucks for that. But then you take a step back because it's like it's tangible. It's like, here's what you do. Here's how you teach it, you know. But to teach how to communicate with human beings well, how to lead others, um, you know, shared vulnerability, communication skills, all that stuff um, that I think is coming more to the forefront now. And like you said, Phil was ahead of his time. Um, but now, like, I'm interested in books and podcasts and webinars on, on, on emotional intelligence, right? Mental health, um, connecting with my players, because I think that's the really important thing, especially like with, with all this COVID stuff and just social media and everything. I think that's just such a huge thing moving forward is how do we develop self-awareness within ourselves and with our, and within our players, um, and, and what does that look like in our practices, in our team meetings, um, you know, week to week, day to day. Um, and I don't, there's not a one size fits all kind of like Rodman there. Um, and it's, it's it could change day to day, but it, and it ta- it's messy and it's hard. And I think sometimes as coaches, um, we're scared to go there and I, I totally get it. It's cause it's hard and you, you know, it's not so black and white. It's that gray area. And, um, but yeah, that's what I find so encouraging about phil jackson's story is just he went there um and it was hard and i think they could have won more i think the bulls could have won more and i think la could have won more like he could have had like 15 rings um yeah i agree with you you i agree with you yeah i agree with you i mean i think there's i think there's uh, you know if you look at the bulls i think there's a good chance that if scotty doesn't go down with the migraine in 1990 i think that they maybe win that game seven against the pistons and then they go on and beat the Lakers for, and that would have been four to start it. And then at the end, obviously, if they bring that team back, there's certainly they'd have an, they would have had an opportunity to win the following year. I, I don't know. I do think that if you take out the two when he was retired, I don't know that they can win. I don't know that they would have been able to win all eight of those yeah. in a row, just because you could see yeah, how, gr- how, yeah, you could see how grinding it was. To be able to be able to make it through there, but I do think you could make a case that they could have won one at the beginning of that first run, and they could have won one at the end of the last run. And then clearly in L.A., My if goodness. if they could have, you know, if they could have kept figured out how to get Shaq and Kobe on the same page and got each of those guys to, and I think primarily Kobe because he was in the secondary position while they were winning. If you could have got Kobe to accept even a co-starring role. Uh, they could have stayed together and won for for a long, long time. Uh, they probably they they probably had, I don't even know how many more if if those guys had been able to peacefully coexist. Can I, can I just point this out too, Mike? Because I think this sure. is an interesting point. If the Chicago Bulls stick together in '99, do the San Antonio Spurs become the San Antonio Spurs, or does everything change because of the Bulls winning, staying and staying together? Because I think I that's know, the, an interesting subplot that isn't going to be talked about, but it could be. But I think Duncan was so good that even if the Spurs don't win it that year, that the Bulls maybe they get one more. I don't know that they get more. I don't know if they get another one beyond one more because that last one was clearly difficult. And they were running on fumes at that point. So even if they get the next one, 
I still think that the Spurs are coming simply because of how good Duncan is. And maybe they, you know, clearly that takes away one title if the Bulls get the one in 99, but I don't think it takes away the whole Spurs dynasty over the next 18 or 19 years. I don't think. But how awesome would that have been to see a Bulls Spurs final? Yeah. In 99, like, my goodness, that would have been. The score would have well, been 68 63. <laughs> yeah, it could have, it could have, could well have been. But yeah, the scores of those games are just jarring when you oh, yeah. juxtapose it with the games today. Such a different uh, the games change so much. Yeah, Jason and I have talked a bunch about how you, know, you can look at Jordan's scoring averages and they're phenomenal in any era. But then you think, okay, he's averaging thirty three a game in an era where teams are only scoring. His team's only scoring ninety. And, you know, he's getting a third of their points. You know, nowadays you score 30, you're only getting a fourth of your team's points because most teams are up in the, you know, 115, 120 range. And it's just, it's amazing how much the game has changed from the three and the spacing and just all that stuff. That it's, it's a totally different game than what you're watching in the last dance for sure. Yep. It would be nice. I wish we could just kind of, you know, time travel and put the bull, like just and just see, because it would be nice to see, Yes. Who could adjust, you know, could LeBron adjust to 1995? Like, I don't know, like all that kind of stuff. It would just be, would be so much fun to see. It would, it really would. And I think it, the thing that always intrigues me with that, even more so than seeing the quote modern guys, like I, I've talked about before, I'd love to see, take Will Chamberlain, take 1962 Will Chamberlain and throw him into, throw him into today's game and just see what, you see what he would look like or have him have, having, his athleticism, the kind of guy that he was, have him grow up where he's now 25 years old in the year 2020. And what does 25-year-old Will Chamberlain look like in today's game? Some of those guys who are older players and didn't have the benefit of all the training and nutrition and travel and all the things that guys have today. I think it comes down to the best. There's no doubt that basketball in 2020 evolution wise is better than it was in 1990 is better than it was in 1970 is better than it was in 1950 as a general rule. But I think you take the best players from any era, you take Bill Russell, you take Will Chamberlain, you move those guys into the year 2020. And yeah, maybe if you just pick pick them up in a time machine and put them in 2020, they don't look great. But if you have them grow up in that era, they're going to be great no matter what the era is that they play in. Oh, exactly. Exactly, and you'd like to see some of those guys that were just, you know, they were unicorns back in the day. Like to see them now, like you said, with all the nutrition and the training now, like what would they be? Yeah, and and so much of it is just, I think, so much of being a great athlete, especially when you get to the NBA level. Guys are so talented athletically that really what separates the best of the best is just the mentality. And I think Jordan's mentality came through so clearly in the documentary that he was a guy who was supremely gifted, had every tool that you would ever want in a basketball player from his body type to his ability to jump and run and the size of his hands and all those things. But there's other guys that had gifts that were similar to that from just a sheer physical standpoint. And what made him the best is just the mentality that he was going to do whatever it took to win. He was going to work harder than anybody in whatever setting he was put into and he just wanted it more than other guys. And he was, I don't want to say impervious to the pressure, but he wasn't afraid of the ramifications of making a mistake. And that's what made him great. And there's just a lot of guys that don't have that. And that translates to any year. I don't care. You can, it could be a hundred years from now. You translate Jordan's mentality into a player a hundred years from now. And that player is still going to be ultra successful. Oh yeah. I and mean, it's just like his mental focus. And like, what did he say in the one, why am I afraid to take a shot I haven't to miss a shot I haven't taken yet? Right. Yeah. Or, you know, exactly. Like that. And his, he just has meant like just his his drivenness and his focus, which I think is so amazing. Like just how you know driven and focused he is. Um, you know the, the the interesting conversations that I've been having with you know different coaches and friends surrounding that is as, again it's not in the documentary. You can't deep dive into every single topic, but I always wonder like. But what's the, like we talked about him, you know, them not interviewing his ex-wife or his kids or stuff like that. It's like, what's the, what's the collateral damage of that type of just ultra focus for one thing, right? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a price to pay. If you're going to yeah. be great at anything, I don't care if it's basketball, 
I don't care if you're the greatest doctor or you're the greatest business owner or CEO. There is a price to pay for being that great at something. Because in order to be that great, you have to have that single-minded focus. You have to be present with that thing that you're focused on to the detriment of other things in your life. It's kind of like if you're, and again, I am in no way, shape or form in this conversation comparing myself to Michael Jordan. But when I was a kid, I played basketball. That's what I wanted to do. And so when it was the night of my senior prom, I was at a local community college paying a dollar to go in and play pickup basketball. I wasn't at the prom and people would ask me things like, <laughs> well, what do you know, why are you sacrificing all these other things in order to play basketball? And I, my answer would always be, it wasn't a sacrifice. Like I didn't, it wasn't like a dilemma for me. I didn't, wasn't debating whether who I really want to go to the prom, but I got to work. Out. No, I just, I wanted to go play basketball. And I think that you give something up if you're going to pursue being the best at whatever it is that you love to do, or if you have that single-minded focus like Jordan did. And I think you're right that, you know, in, in a lot of cases, I think his family became collateral damage. And he was so, you could just see the guy was just wired. Like, I don't, did he ever sleep? It just oh, seems man. like he was always doing whatever and just had boundless energy. And if you're a normal person who's married to him, you have to be looking at that going, this is insane. Like, how can this guy do this? <laughs> how does he do this? I think one, I, you know, and they didn't have time to, to go here, but I'd be really interested to see something in the future because some stuff's coming out about his relationship with Kobe. And, you know, I think they were a lot closer than a lot of people knew. And, um, you know, Jordan kind of mentored and taught Kobe so much, but there's stuff coming out now which I find fascinating is like, it seems like Kobe kind of figured out the family thing later on. It's like, he was so driven, but then near the end of his career started to make that switch to like more of a family man and realized it at a younger age than Jordan. And so Jordan started seeing that in Kobe and then, and that, and that's how kind of Kobe influenced Michael, you know, now, especially like Michael has six year old twins. I didn't even know that. Right. Um, you know, so, um, and now he's be kind of going back and he's more of a family man now and, you know, taking more time to be, be part of that. And so I just think it's just interesting how things come full circle sometimes. Yeah, it really is. And I think that, like you said, the influence of Kobe on Jordan, the influence of Jordan on Kobe, I don't think anybody had any idea of the depth of their relationship prior to the memorial service for Kobe out there in LA. I think that was surprising to a lot of people. And it's been interesting to see, the reaction to. So you think about Jordan's post playing career and the three biggest things that he's been in the public eye for one, his hall of fame speech, which sort of captured the competitive <laughs> killer Jordan. Yeah. And then you had the Kobe Memorial, which captured a completely different side of people that I don't think mm. a lot of people even realized was in there. And then in the documentary, you got to see, I think he went back to more of that competitive side of Jordan. That was more of what he wanted to present within the documentary, which is again, understandable, which relates to the story of him being the greatest player of all time and the story and everything that went along with the documentary. But I do think you're right. There's some interesting pieces to his personality that were left out. And then I think the other thing that would be interesting, and I don't know if we'll ever get this, but you think about a guy like Jordan, who the first time he retires, he goes and plays baseball. So he has that competitive piece of it. He retires a second time, sits out, then eventually decides to come back. You wonder what that process was like for him coming back. And when did he decide to come back? Did he want to come back earlier? And then you have after the third retirement, now he buys the Hornets. He's never really had a tremendous amount of success running a franchise. And you just wonder like, how is his day to day when you're that wired to be that competitive and to be doing the things that he was doing out on the basketball floor, you just wonder how much of a void there is day to day for him that he can't do the things that he was put on the earth to do for lack of a better way was, of saying it. There was it. an article that was going around last week that he played Michael Kidd Kid Gokas like two seasons ago and beat, beat him in one-on-one. -on -one. When your 55 year old owner or how old <laughs> he was beats one of your best players, you're, you're definitely not going to be successful uh, as a, as a, um, as a team. Just my opinion. I don't know. Oh man. But like you hit on something really, I think really interesting there 
in that, you know, Michael retires three times, you know, comes back twice. You know, I think there was some, you know, some pretty extenuating circumstances with the first retirement with his dad and just, I think he was worn out and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, you think about, you know, we talk about mental health of our athletes and everything. I still remember when my college baseball career was done, um, I went and played summer ball um, after our season was done, had a couple pro offers, tryouts for independent ball, turned them down, you know, had one semester left of school. And I went back to my school and was hanging out with my old teammates who were still playing and everything. And I, I was not prepared at 23 years old, um, to not be part of a team anymore. Like I, I, and I didn't, I didn't know what was coming. Like I didn't know, um, you know, the loneliness, you know, how much I would miss just being part of a team, um, you know, going to battle every day, train together, being with each other. Right. Like, um, and I think there's a lot to be said, you know, for Jordan, um, you know, especially coming back with the wizards, like he probably just really, I just wonder like how much he just missed. Like you said competitive guy loves to compete. Um, you know, he's probably miserable for those two years you know, before he came back. And so, but I think it's very telling also to think of just our current athletes, like whether you're finishing your high school career or your college career, or maybe you get lucky enough to play pro for a little bit. Um, that transition is really difficult. It can be really difficult. And like, you know, has me thinking lately, like how am I preparing my seniors or my guys for life after basketball? Right. Cause they're not part of that. Yeah. I don't think that that's something that a coach Again, we go back in time, and I don't think that's something that a coach would have ever had a conversation with a player in that circumstance. I know that I never would have had that type of conversation with any coaches no. that I played for. And I think what you said struck a chord with me because I know that when I was done playing, that there's a void there. And to be honest with you, I can honestly say there's still a void there. Like there's nothing for me that I've done in my life that has ever replaced being a basketball player as competitive as I might be as a coach, as competitive as I might be in my life and other things. There's nothing that has replaced playing for me from a standpoint of the intensity of my focus and what I wanted to do day to day. There just, there just isn't. And I think part of that is, you play sports when you're young and when things are fresh and it's such an intense experience to be 14 years old, to be 18 years old, to be 20 years old. And as you get older, you mellow and you have this deeper perspective. But when you're young, you're just so dialed in and so focused. And then when that's gone, all of a sudden, because in most cases, not that necessarily anybody thinks they're going to have a pro career, but most high school players think I'm probably going to get a chance to play college basketball if you're somebody who loves the game and works at it and feels that way and conversely when you're a college player you probably feel like oh, i'm going to get a shot to play somewhere else and then all of a sudden it's finished and you're right shane that when you start thinking about the mental health of players and you start thinking about how to help them adjust to life after basketball those are conversations that coaches probably in the past never would have considered having and now coaches like yourself and people who are starting to become aware of mental health issues that affect not just players, but people in general, those are the kind of, kind of conversations that as a coach, it's almost, you're almost obligated to have those to be able to help your players. When we talk about trying to produce people who are going to have healthy, productive lives, that's, that's a big part of what we're going to end up doing besides the basketball piece of it or the baseball piece of it or soccer or whatever. It's our obligation to be able to impact those players on a level that's going to continue to benefit them after they're, after they're all done playing. And I think that's something that, again, it's great to see coaching going in that direction. Well, you know, I never, I never had those conversations with all the, my coaches growing up as well, high school or college about life after baseball or basketball or whatever. Um, you know, and so I think one of the beautiful things as a coach now is like, as a, you know, we're coaches, we're mentors, life, whatever you want to call us, we get, the opportunity to to influence mentor our the players that we have the the privilege of, of coaching and working with we get to give them what we weren't given right like we we learn from all of our the awesome coaches that we had growing up we learned so much from them what to do but we also get to learn well what was missing 
you know um and so what did what would i what what did i need as a student athlete back in the day that i didn't know at the time i needed but now that i'm in this position i get to be that or give that to the 12 14 guys that are part of my program um every year and so i think that's just one of the again one of the great awareness pieces just in coaching now is that we we get we get to be that for our guys and i'm glad the conversations are happening because um yeah definitely i never had those in my playing career absolutely not so let's go back to sort of the beginning of your coaching career and as a college baseball player you get done with school and you start thinking about what you're going to do when was coaching on your radar and how did it become that basketball was the first opportunity that you got? And then why did you decide to stay with basketball coaching as opposed to maybe coaching baseball? Well, um, I knew ever since, honestly, ever since, as far as I can remember, I, I always knew and it probably became solidified in high school that I wanted to teach and coach. Um, it was either one of those two things. My, I remember my, I still remember the conversation you know, I was probably reading the reading the sports section over breakfast one morning in high school. And my dad asked me, he's like, hey, have you, I think it was grade 11 or 11th grade. And he just asked, hey, have you thought about what you want to do after high school? Um, you know, because some, some post-secondary options were starting to come into to view for both basketball and baseball. And I was like, well, I think I want to be a teacher or a pastor. And he's like, oh, okay. And um, ended up going going the teaching route and so um basically the way I got into coaching I, I knew I always wanted to coach you know even in, in college talking with numerous of my teammates or roommates we, we all many of us had dreams of you know running you know and I didn't know what sport it was going to be yet I just knew I wanted to coach right I like I love both baseball and basketball I'm like heck I'll, I'll do both just let me do both um which, you know, maybe down the line, like I, I do get to kind of do both now, but um, my last semester, um, so I played five years. I, I, I attended Northwestern State in Louisiana um, for two years, played two years there. Then I redshirted my third year, transferred then to, um, at the time, it was Central Missouri State University in Warrensburg, Missouri. So I went from a Division One school to Division Two school. They're now the University of Central Missouri. and. Uh, Played two years there, and I had one semester left, so I had to go do my student teaching and practicum and all that kind of stuff in the fall. So that's when I went back and was living with some old teammates and stuff like that. And uh, I got an email. I was almost done my my three my semester there, um, and got an email, <laughs> kind of oddly enough, from um, an old girlfriend's mom who was a teacher in my hometown, and she just said, "Hey, heard." You might be coming, moving back home uh, after you graduate. Um, our high school w- really needs some needs a needs a coach for their varsity boys basketball team. They just need an assistant coach, but not a head coach. And I was like, well, if I'm back, you know, I'd be interested, but I don't know my plans yet. I had a I had a job offer in Kansas City to teach elementary school, and I was like, I really enjoyed the Kansas City area and um, really enjoyed my time you know, living in the States and was thinking about that, but I had just gotten engaged to my, my girlfriend who was living up here in Saskatchewan. And so we decided, you know what, like, let's, let's just start off back home. And, uh, so ended up moving back home at Christmas, basically coming in to a program, um, that, so I came in about six weeks into their season and it was a pretty big mess overall, like is probably the most challenging coaching situation i could find myself into right away um within two weeks i was no longer the assistant coach i was the head coach because the head coach just stopped showing up and so kind of by default i was this 23 year old first time head coach and when i got there we had 13 players you know over christmas break and we were pretty terrible um we did a lot of layups to put it that way um and a lot of conditioning. So I was like, well, at the very least, we're going to be able to keep up with teams if we can't actually catch and pass and shoot the ball. Um, so walked into that. And so within about a month, we only had six players for academic reasons. We were at a pretty rough school, legal issues, all that kind of stuff. And so, but it was also probably, probably one of the most challenging 
coaching um, introductions for a young guy could ever have <laughs> in many ways, but it was also one of the best learning experiences, and I have fond memories of those six guys, and I'm still in contact with a few of them now, and one of them actually teaches my kids, um, and we came, we became pretty close, and we worked really hard. Imagine going into into games with six guys. It made I had nobody complaining about playing time. We'll put it that way. Yeah, um, that's for sure. <laughs> which was really good. So that's kind of how I got my start. So I didn't I didn't really pick a sport. I I got an email and an opportunity and took it. And what did you learn? What did you learn that first year? What were some things that you took away that maybe were different from what your perception of coaching was going into it? What are some things that you took away from that first year that still impact you today? Um that I needed a lot of help <laughs> and it's okay to ask for help. Um, I was pretty, you know, I, I was at that time I was five years out of um, playing high school ball myself. And I was, a, a, you know, for our area up here, I was a pretty strong player. And then going to this other school where, you know, the talent level was pretty low. And I just kind of expected that I could tell guys what to do and they'd be able to do what I used to do. Um, and I learned really quickly that that was unrealistic. Um, and yeah, just learning how to run a practice, you know, what finding a system that fits your guys, what, like, I had no idea even what I wanted to run, you know, as like, you know, do we plays that we all eventually we played a lot of zone just because we had six guys, but it's like, just trying to figure that out. But I learned right away how much I didn't know. Um, and that I needed to start asking a lot of questions to other coaches um, to learn, you know, and that's and that's basically when you know I started my my DVD collection and borrowing binders from coaches all over the place because you know there just wasn't this kind of like coaches weren't sharing the game for free in 2003 like they are now, um, you know, so. For me, the biggest takeaway was, yeah, I just needed help and to get rid of my ego and just to ask a ton of questions. So I never got to be an assistant coach, right? I just got thrown into, oh, I, sorry, I did for two weeks um, and then just took over, you know, a pretty messy situation. So who did you go and talk to beyond going and getting the DVDs? Did you have a local coach in the area? Did you have, who did you go and talk to face to face to be able to ask questions to? Ironically enough, I, I there was three 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 coaches that locally my old high school coach I went to him, um, you know, and his teams were so good they were just and they just I mean we we played them like if you can imagine coaching against your old coach and losing by eighty points like that's how bad it was. Um, <laughs> and then our uh, another coach locally who was the coach of our rival when I was in high school fantastic coach um he i reached out to him and he had been teaching elementary school he had moved on and was coaching some and had coached some of the players that i was going to be getting in a year or two and he basically just gave me his whole basketball library he had me over to his house he's like here you go this is all i know this is this is what worked for me make it your own um and then i had him actually come in and run some practices um, he came in and he ran some practice. So I just got to learn like, and watch and observe and take notes. Like, here's how you organize a practice. Here's how you transition. Um, you know, here's how you, you make the best use of, of your time. Um, so that was really huge. And then my old volleyball coach from high school, he helped me out as well. He, he played, uh, NAIA in North Dakota. And so he had some basketball background. He was a local referee. And I just said, Hey, I'll take anything I can get. <laughs> so he came out and you know, to a practice and help me implement an offensive system that just a pick and roll system that we were trying to trying to do. So um, I just kind of leaned on people in the local area that I was close to, um, you know, compared to now, like, you know, working with coaches all over North America and you can send a tweet or a text and, and an email and all of a sudden you got an 80 page PDF in your inbox. Yeah, it's incredible. That's one of the things that we've been I don't know if surprise is the right word, but we've just been amazed by the willingness of coaches at every single level to share the game, to share what they know. And I've made the comment before that in a lot of cases, even if you wanted to keep something secret today, 
it's almost impossible to be able to keep something to yourself anyway, even if you wanted to, especially from an X's and O standpoint, when you think about how game film is exchanged and all that kind of thing. It's just, there's, there's nothing that is a secret anymore on the X's and O side. The culture piece of it, I think there's still a lot of value in the things that coaches do. And what we found is just people are willing to share. They want to help the game of basketball improve. And it's no longer necessarily just about, hey, I want a, my team to be successful and I really don't care what goes on with all these other teams and these other players. And instead it's, yeah, I want my team to be successful. I want my kids and my players to really have success, but I also want to see lots of other people in the game succeed and ultimately use the game to be able to improve the lives of everyone who's involved with it. And to me, that's been one of the things that I've enjoyed so much about the podcast is getting a chance to talk to coaches who are so willing to share and who are so focused on how to make the game itself better for everybody who's involved in it. It's been so refreshing for me to see that and be able to hear and talk to people from all over the country at all different levels of basketball. Well, it's so it's so refreshing and so it's so refreshing to the point that sometimes it almost gets overwhelming because you're like there's so many people willing to talk to you, which I think is just a fantastic problem to have. I couldn't um, agree more. You know, like just being able to, I can get on my phone here and call a, a coach from Louisiana, you know, 30 hours away and be like, hey, you know, what what do you got here? And all of a sudden I got a fast fast draw diagram in my inbox in two minutes, right? Um, you know, or just being able to share whatever problem you have. Like, I think it's, I think it's pretty cool where we're at and just the shift of not coaches just trying to protect their own program um but you know the coaching the coaching fraternity or brotherhood i think is actually becoming a brotherhood it really um, is because it's a it's a grind it's a there's no better job but it's also extremely hard and i just i don't think people understand that so to be able to connect with fellow coaches who can empathize um i think is 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 sweet like it and, and much needed yeah, there's tremendous value in being able to connect with people who are going through the same thing. I equate it a lot to your experience sometimes as a teacher in the classroom. And I know that you'll sometimes be in your school and I've been in this situation where you'll be teaching and you'll have a tough day or you'll have a tough week and you'll think, gosh, I'm the only person that this ha is happening to because so often you just are inside your classroom and you're dealing with your students and you're not getting maybe an opportunity to talk to any of your coworkers. Mm -hmm. And then you finally do get a chance to talk to them and you realize, oh yeah, everybody's experiencing these same frustrations and difficulties and joys that I am. And it's nice to be able to share that with somebody. And I think coaching, it's very, very easy to fall into that same scenario where you're so focused on your team. You're so focused on the winning and losing. You're so focused on getting the maximum out of your team that you sometimes think that you're the first person who's experienced this type of challenge with this player or this type of situation with this team. And yet you realize when you talk to other coaches that, no, these same things have been happening for years and years and years and years. And there's lots of people out there who have tried lots of different solutions to those problems. You just need to be able to find those people and to be able to step back out of your own situation and have a conversation with coaches, which obviously today is way, way easier to do than it was 20 or 30 years ago when we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the openness of the coaching fraternity as you described. Well, just, I think being able to flex your empathy muscle is such a huge, just to be able to show empathy to other coaches, but then to be vulnerable yourself, um, just to be like, I don't know what to do in this situation or I need help or, you know, it can even come down to, I'm just super stressed, anxious because of whatever reason. And just being able to know that you've got so many fellow coaches that will either just be a listening ear for you to vent to, or, or to actually help give you some ideas like, Hey, but try this, or just to encourage you to be like, Hey man, I've, I've been there. It sucks, you know, and just, uh, Sometimes coaches just need to know that they're not alone, right? Because I think coaching can be such a lonely profession. Um, and I don't know the, the stats on it, but, you know, um, I talked to a coach who was pretty high up a number of years ago, and he went to 
you know, he was on this committee, went to the national championships, and he was just like, Shane said, um, protect your family and your marriage at, at all costs because he's like, he went to this national championship with all these amazing coaches and they had their coaching social. And he's like, almost every single coach was either divorced, um, uh, cheating on his spouse, or was abusing some type of substance, mostly alcohol, just because they were so stressed out with their job. And I think now we have a platform where it's, again, it's a lot easier to get support if we need it, right? And, and be there for each other. Absolutely. All right. That's a great topic that we've touched on in several other podcasts, but I think it's a one that's worth investigating a little bit here with you as you brought it up. And that is when you think about coaches and their lives and you think about how coaching has evolved over time. And I think that on every level, the amount of time required of a coach has always been high, but I think it's increased in the last 10 years tremendously from what a high school coach, the baseline amount of hours that a high school coach has to put in both in and out of season in order to just be competitive has risen. At the college level, I think it's the same thing. There's always been a demand on your time, but I think those demands continue to go up, especially based on the system of basketball that we have today and the need for player workouts and things to be organized and led by coaches in a lot of cases. So talk a little bit about, or maybe give some coaches some tips, advice, some things that have worked for you in terms of protecting your family relationships, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, how you go about managing that compared to or balanced with your desire, your ambition as a coach to be as successful as you possibly can. Well, you know, unfortunately, I had I had to learn the hard way, which you know maybe some other coaches could empathize with me. <laughs> they had to learn the hard way, um, <laughs> you know. And so, probably like most coaches, I'm extremely driven. Um, you know, on more than one occasion, woken up in the middle of the night, can't get back to sleep, so I'm just thinking about practice the next day, or the game the night before, or whatever it is, and um, it can it can be all consuming. And I still remember as a young coach, like just being, especially as our, you know, we'd get, we got a little better every year with that first team that I had. But um, I was like wondering, like, is this, is this what this is going to be like? Like getting pounded every night, you know, getting a couple more wins every season. Like this, this, there has to be more than this. And then, then I got my first teaching job two and a half years later, got to take over a program full time started getting some success and then after two years there got got offered um a head coach at age 28 got offered a head coaching job um coaching women's college basketball at the same school i'm at now but now i'm coaching the men's program and i did that for four years and love that for the first two and a half years building up a program you know a, a program that i took over that was winless and at that time, and then we, we grew it into a competitive program by year three. And the pressures that started to come with that and my expectations weren't meeting. Um, I wasn't meeting my own expectations. And then I started being, I was still teaching and coaching, you know, college basketball. And uh, I, you know, a young family, uh, by that time we had two of my boys were born. So... You know, I had a newborn and a two-year-old, and I ended up, for me, um, I ended up resigning after halfway through my fourth year. I finished out the year, but I was just, I got to the point where I was so mentally drained and thought I was just such a terrible coach because we had injuries and some culture stuff going on, but I had lost my, like, I didn't know why I was doing this anymore. Coaching became not fun, um, you know. I was overeating. I was just anxious. I wasn't healthy. I was not exercising, all that kind of stuff. And I wasn't sleeping and my wife was worried about me. And so I was like, you know what? I need to step back. But a friend, a friend after that gave me a book and you know, you probably had a, other guests talk about it, but it was kind of the start of my journey of, of kind of turning things around was the book Inside Out Coaching by, by Joe Ehrman. And if 
for coaches out there, if they if they're trying to pick a book to start out their coaching journey to figure out why they're doing this, um, that's probably the first one I would recommend. And then um, the next one would probably be Every Moment Matters, a new release by John O'Sullivan. Like those are for me, those are the top two books. Just if you're a coach starting out or a coach a coach at any time, if you haven't read them, read them, read them. They just turn things around. And so a friend gave me this and. The book had some questions and is like asked like what why do you coach what's it like what um how does it feel to be coached by you um why do you coach the way you do and it also has you looking at um your past coaches and how they coached you and how much that's influencing the way you coach but i started things like what is it like to be coached by me like how how do my players feel being coached for me like and and then it introduced like a bigger purpose to coaching. It wasn't just to win basketball games. Like Joe Airman had taken over an inner city school in Baltimore, and basically um, his his purpose was you know developing you know for lack of a better term life champions. Like he wanted to build young men, and people would ask him, "Well, how how do you how do you gauge success?" And he's like, "Ask me in twenty years. Um, you know, let's see where my players are. Like, what kind of husbands are they? What kind of community members are they? What kind of fathers are they?" That sort of stuff, and so he's like, so he's he, that was the first time. It's weird, I don't know why, but that was the first time I'd ever heard of a of a coach emphasize those things and still have success within his his team. And he was coaching football, so that kind of set me on a on a different trajectory of of just saying, hey, I gotta I gotta switch things around here, and so my purpose needs to be bigger than winning championships or making playoffs or winning games, and. Because that's always going to be there because I don't think, I don't know any coach who doesn't want to win the game. Um, but that could be pretty empty if that's all you're doing it for. So I had to kind of rediscover my why and, and, and think deeper. It's like, and I always love my players, but um, I think I was a bit, I would always say I was a, a transformational coach. Like I cared more about who my players are becoming rather than wins and losses. But if you look, if I look back on, look back on it, I'd have to be honest and say I was pretty transactional um, and I would have, I was focused more on, Hey, what can my, what players can help me get to where I want to get as a coach um, and started to experience some success and just realized I don't want to succeed that way. That's not a fun way to succeed. And so, um, yeah, to protect myself, you know, I work with a mentor and he keeps me in check of, of my why and why I'm doing what I, and he's a, he's a sounding board for me and, and builds into me, whether I'm down or up or just need help growing. I think coaches, we always need to grow, um, you know, being vulnerable with my wife and just, you know, being willing to just tell her when I'm tired or anxious or stressed. And, uh, so she knows, um, instead of just trying to hold it in and power through and just be the tough guy. Um, and just surrounding myself with friends um, that I can talk to. For me, I need to talk. And if I talk, I feel better. Um, before, I used to hold it in and just be like, I just got to figure everything out, you know, to kind of go along with our discussion of just the, the brotherhood or the fraternity of coaches is to have coaches who can empathize and help. Um, for the longest time, I was a lone wolf just trying to do it all myself. And that can be really exhausting and just realized. I like having a team around me. I like having assistant coaches around me. I like having players who we have a shared vision. Let's go do it together. It's so much more rewarding to share that success or that growth or that vision with somebody else instead of just making it all about you. Because then if you get there, you look around the room and nobody's there. So, um, you know, those are just a few things. Of, you know, and then just knowing who you are, like self-care, taking care of yourself. For me, a big one is just making sure I exercise a little bit every day, get the blood pumping, get the brain right. Um, reading's a big thing for me, uh, making sure I just get reading just energizes me, whether it's an audio book or just a book like on anything, just, I just need to read. And it just seems like it's like my morning, pick me up my coffee, like just, just go. Um, I need that. And then, yeah, I just need friendships around me. So, you know, exercise, reading, um, you know, and, and probably a big one for me is just, is just prayer. Um, just to center myself with understanding why, why I do this, you know, the amount of faith and just. Just, uh, you know, giving things to God when I feel stressed and even when things are going good. Um, and, uh, 
So those are kind of the foundations of, of what keeps me keeps me centered. And I can tell if, if one of those things is out of alignment, then you know I can I can tell something's off. To put it that way, and and those around me can as well. Do you think that up until the point where you got introduced to Joe Ehrman's book and you had sort of that epiphany, for lack of a better way of saying it, do you think that a lot of your growth as a coach was focused on the X's and O's side of I have to learn more about the technical aspects of the game of basketball? And then after that epiphany, you became more focused on some of the things that you just talked about in terms of your why, the culture, having an impact on your players and being more trans- transformational as opposed to transactional. Is, it, is that kind of the clear demarcation for you of when the shift went from I'm a basketball coach and X's and O's coach and that's where my focus is to I'm more shifting towards the culture, transformational relationship style coach? Uh, 100%. And it's it's funny because I started making that shift in my mind, but in, in practice, it probably took me another three years, three, four years. <laughs> um, so I started like, yeah, I want to I wanna be this type of coach. I want to, you know, the Joe Airman way, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I was saying it, but I wasn't living it. Um, and that just creates a whole different other challenge because, you know, if, if you're saying one thing to your players, and but they're seeing something else, there's a disconnect there. You know, you're lacking authenticity. And I didn't see it in myself. I thought I was I was that guy. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm I'm being tra- I care you know, I'm being transformational, all that all the, all that cliche cool stuff. And then um, you know, fast forward a few years, um, you know, had started, you know, as doing my master's degree in leadership and all this kind of stuff and reading a lot of books and um came across a book called Burn Your Goals by Joshua Medcalf and and uh, it, it rocked my world. Read it about you know three four times, and I remember after I'd read it that summer, I had just taken over the Varsity Boys program again. And this was I think 2015, and um, we had a really young team. I was starting five sophomores, so I knew we were going to take some lumps, but it was the, the next three years I, were going to be pretty fun because I knew we were going to grow together. And by the third year, we had a pretty special team. But about three weeks into that season, we're in practice. And, you know, this is when the light bulb really came on was we were we were doing some type of like layup, like one on one type of type of drill with some passing stuff like that. And sorry, no, it was like a two on two drill. And we were turning the ball over, I think, about every 15 seconds. Like, we could not make a play. And, you know, I'm getting stressed. I'm getting frustrated. I don't get, like, we, we can't do this simple thing. And, again, we're young. And maybe I was having a bad day. I can't remember. Um, and my blood just starts to boil. And, you know, one more turnover happens, and I just, I lose it. I start screaming and yelling. I take the basketball, I pound it against the floor, it hits the roof. I just, I, I'm not saying anything constructive at all. I'm just mad at my guys. And after my little 30 second rant, the gym's just quiet. And I got all these 15, 16 year olds staring at me, 17 year olds. My two assistant coaches just kind of put their heads down and look at the floor and walk around. And I just see faces and eyes just drop. And I'm just like, what did I just do? Like, we're three weeks into our season. So we jumped to the next drill, and it was terrible. Although I just sucked the life out of practice. So we stopped practice early. I go home, and as soon as I walk in the door, my wife just sees me, and she's like, what happened? Because she could just <laughs> see it on my on my face and my body language. I was like, I have to change. Like, I can't do this anymore. Um, I can't coach like this. I can't be – like, I'm never a big yeller or screener, screener, but I can be pretty intense. And uh, I said, I got, I got to change. And next day, um, had a meeting with my guys, apologized to them, and just said, guys, that's not the coach I want to be for you guys. That's not the kind of coach I want to model. And I said, from this point on, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to yell at you guys. Here's the standards. Here's the expectations. 
And if you don't want to meet them, then the the penalty you you just won't participate. That's just what it is. Like I said, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna yell and scream at you guys to get you to do what I think you need to be doing. Is like I want you to find that motivation within you intrinsically. And I remember when I said it because we had pretty good relationships with the guys, but it was funny because some of the guys just kind of started snickering in the meeting because <laughs> they didn't believe it. And I was like, guys, I'm serious. And you know, a few months later. Some of the guys started like, Coach, when you told us that for the first time, we thought it would last like a week or two and then be back to normal. And they're like, no, but you stuck with it. And at first it was really hard because, you know, a young team were making mistakes that we shouldn't. Um, it was tough. And we just started building in different principles that we were going to base our program off and live and die by them. I said, guys, this might take us longer to get where we're going, but I'm tired. I'm tired of this old way of doing things and we're going to try it. And that first year was was tough. We took some lumps. Um, the next year we experienced some growth, but we still weren't getting 100% buy-in from the guys. And then by year three, when a lot of those guys were in their senior year, it was about, a, oh, I don't know, January. Something just clicked. And it, it was kind of beautiful because it seemed everything we were teaching, you know, the principles, you know, pushing intrinsic motivation, um, all that kind of stuff just kind of came together and the guys just bought in 100%. And it's almost like they knew what I was going to say before, like we'd call a timeout and I'd start like, coach, no, we know what you're going to say. And then they would just, they would say it. And I was like, this is awesome. But it took, <laughs> it took two seasons and it was tough. And then we ended up having, we ended up finishing pretty strong that year and doing well. But um, one of my, my players after that season stopped by I was a I was the vice principal in the high school at the time and he stopped by my office and he just popped his head he's like coach he's like um I'd never understood for the first you know it took took me two seasons to buy into what you were you were selling us and he's like now I get it you know because this was a kid who always wanted me to yell at him he's like yell at me coach yell at me coach and I'm like I'm not yelling at you anymore you need to find that motivation deep down and you you know you, you want to rebound or hustle or whatever it is we're trying to get you to do because you want what's best for you and the team not because you're scared that i'm going to yell at you that's not the point of this right and he fought that for two years and then it finally clicked for him the last six weeks of, our, of his senior year and it was beautiful um you know because here's a kid who i think that's what he was used to at home and so that's what he wanted from me and i wasn't going to do that anymore so it, it you know it was hard it took time I'm, I'm, maybe some other coaches could get quicker buying than i did <laughs> than it taken two two and a half seasons but it was pretty pretty sweet you know being able to go through that and then see the fruit of that a few years later what were some specific things that you put in place some specific standards that you wanted your players to live up to that you had to find yourself just reminding them of what those standards were as opposed to yelling at them and saying, hey, you got to do this. What were some specific things that you put into place? You know, this is not going to be, this isn't going to be crazy, like mind blowing, but at that time we just had to get back to the basics. And it, it basically started with, hey guys, like guys, what do you want this program to be? Right? And before it was me defining that all the time, it was like, okay, this is what we got to do, and I got to get these guys here so we can win games and, and win a championship, all that kind of stuff. And once I s stopped dictating that and started making it more player-led, um, that's when things started to happen. So, you know, when we just kind of met as a team, it was like, what are our standards? Okay, you know, be on time. Well, what does be on time look like? Everybody needs to be dressed and warmed up and ready to go five minutes before you say we're supposed to be there. I'm like, beautiful. Love that. Let's do that. Right. Um, what does it look like in practice? You know, like what does intensity look like in practice? So like, and what do you guys want the consequences to be if A, B, and C don't happen? So just started giving power of voice to the players to, to decide like, guys, this isn't my program. This is our program. And it's more your program. Like I'm going to coach you. I love you guys. Let's go. And yeah, I want to win, but what do you guys want this season to be like? And I always told him, I said, guys, I just want you guys to be done at the end of the season just to have no regrets. Did you give everything you could you could give? So we just looked at everything from, um, 
you know, punctuality to team meetings to um, what practice would look like. What does, you know, even drills. I started letting some of my players like lead some of the practice, which was really hard to do, my goodness. But it was just, you know, to let them see that I'm, I'm trying to make this as your team, guys. Uh, but then it was also really interesting as me and my assistant sat off just to watch what the guys focused on. Um, and then it told us, like, here's what the players are seeing. Here's what um, they feel they, they need to get better at. So I think it just developed a lot more trust and clarity. And then, and then for me to actually follow through with what I said I was going to do, like how I was going to behave. You know, when I was like, guys, like the way I've been yelling and screaming sometimes and being upset, when is that ever okay in the workplace? Like when, like, can I do that as a principal? No. You know, can your parents do that at their workplace? Well, what would happen if they did? Will they get fired? Well, I'm like, then why is it okay for me to do that with you here? It's, it's not, right? There's a better way to be intense, right? So we just switched it from the, the, the team just started setting the standards and I said so. And if they didn't meet them, then they decided the consequences. Well, that was just, it wasn't running. It was just, well, then just set us off because it hurts more not to play or not be a part of practice or not be part of what we're, what we're going into. So that was the strategy. And again, it took time, but it, but it worked and it kind of gave a voice to these players. And for the first time, I think they were given a voice to decide, well, what do you want this program to be? And uh, yeah, it took some time, but um, eventually it came around and um, things started going pretty good in a couple of seasons. What I love about that is something that I think is critically important when you're talking about putting standards in place for your team. And you can talk about our team's going to play hard or we're going to be punctual or we're going to do this or do that. And what I love about what you said is that you attached behaviors to those standards. Because I think a lot of times as coaches, one of the things that we get caught up in is we'll say something of what we want. So we want intensity or we want punctuality or we want whatever it is. And then we might know what we want that to look like, but our players are just guessing. And I think it's so, so important to be able to give players an actual behavior of this is what it looks like when we're doing and meeting this standard. And when you do that, I think you make it a lot easier for the players to live up to that standard when they know what the behavior is that's associated with that standard, when they know what you're going to be judging them on. Same way you think about it in the classroom as a teacher. If your students know what the expectations are for the assignment, they're much more likely to be able to meet it as opposed to you just throwing stuff out there without any type of parameters of what it's actually going to look like. And to me, that's so, so important. And it goes to, again, the communication piece of being a great coach is being able to get your players to understand what you want and then getting them to buy in. So as you said, that it's a player-led team and the players are the ones taking that responsibility for putting those things together. And to me, that's critical. Well, um, I just think I've found, again, it's only over the last probably five years that I've really adopted and it's tough giving up control because i think as coaches we love being in control like it's hard um but as soon as i started asking the guys like well, what do you want this to be like what do you want this to look like 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 what do you guys value and then you know they list core values all that kind of stuff we've all done it as coaches but then like you said well what does that look like like what's the behavior associated with that value right like what really matters to you guys and then well like you know, whatever it is. So it was just really cool to start seeing the light bulbs go off in their own brains. And I'm like, and then it takes, pre honestly, it takes pressure off me as the coach. And like, I can, I can navigate those conversations, right? Like we're brainstorming all that kind of stuff, but all of a sudden it's a different sense of, of buy-in because the players have decided. So if, if the players, you know, if somebody breaks one of the, um, yeah, I don't like standards. I don't like the the, the word rules. Um, if one of the players doesn't meet the standard, they didn't meet their own standard. It's not my standard. It's our standard. It's your standard. I'm like you, you guys. And in some cases, it's the guy that he's the one that came up with it, <laughs> right? And so absolutely, right. So I just find it's just such a powerful exercise to do with your 
with your players, but the big thing is you have to follow through with it, right? Because, you know, a lot of players will at first test, are we actually going to abide by these? But yeah, I, I've just found that an incredibly powerful thing is let your let your team drive what you value, the behaviors and standards. Because um, then it's, all, it's more on them. All right, let's talk a little bit about the difference between being a head coach on the women's side, head coach on the men's side. <laughs> what's What's different? What's the same? What have you learned from having both experiences? Oh my goodness! I gotta be careful here. Um, <laughs> probably the probably the biggest thing I would say is that what I found in both cases was when I took over the women's program, I had their trust right away. I had to lose their trust. So my tr- so. I took over the program, brought in, I can't remember, I think we had 13 girls the first year, and they trust me right away, and trust was established pretty quickly, and the only way I was not going to have that trust is if I did something to lose that trust. Um, when I took over the men's program two years ago, I remember having a team meeting with, it was after their season was done, I was on campus, we had a team meeting with all the guys from that team and just basically for a chance for them to talk to me, ask me questions, that sort of thing. Basically, me get to lay out my vision, who I am. Um, so at that time, many of them only like, well, he's just a high school coach. I'm like, well, I did coach college at one time and all that kind of stuff. But um, I found with guys, you have to earn their trust. You don't have it right away. And so it's like, yeah, they'll come play for you. But then it's you, you got to, I find... I don't, I didn't, I don't, you don't get their trust right away. Like you've got to prove that you can do what you're say, say you're going to do. So I found that was one big difference with guys and girls. Um, I found coaching the women's game. They wanted to be told what to do more. They wanted to like run a specific system as like, well, coach, like, where do I go here, here, and here? And so they wanted a very scripted, and maybe that was the type of player I had at that time. And, all that kind of stuff, and maybe the programs they came from, but the girls really wanted me just to lay every little detail out for them. Whereas I find with the guys, and you know, the game's changed over the last 10 years, but they want to kind of know what's more of our, like, how are we going to play? Right? Like, what's the expectation? Are we playing up tempo, you know, moving, like, whatever it is, they want to, and then they want to have a bit of a framework, but they want to have more freedom within that framework. And so, I found that really interesting is like trying to give kind of like the whole thing with the team setting the standards is like giving a bit of rope, letting guys make mistakes, um, coaching them through it to gain that trust. And then sometimes honestly, gaining that trust is you getting them to play a certain way or wanting to play a certain way. And they may be skeptical, but you still let them kind of make their mistakes throughout it to, to, so that they can see where you're trying to lead them in order to gain that trust, like, oh, okay, now coach, now I get what you're talking about, right? That sort of thing. So I think those are two of the the biggest differences um, with guys and girls. Probably the third one is, um, I found building a, a, a healthy culture much more difficult on the girls' side. I found that if there's some type of... Re- like squabble or relational discord within the team, the girls will carry that onto the court. And I found, I found with the guys, they might have a disagreement, but as soon as they step between the lines, they're going to compete together. And I found that with the girls, I had to just work through things like a lot more, a lot more conversations, working things out. Guys tend to get over things a little more in, in my situation, tended to kind of, let things go, but you still had to deal with it because it would still linger. But when you step between the lines, I found the guys just kind of, they just go play, um, but the girls will carry that on. So those are kind of the the three different challenges, but it was, it's been good having the perspective of both. Cause I think coaching the girls for four years has helped me tremendously um, move in, move into the men's college game. I can completely understand how having all those experiences and, coaching at the high school level and coaching at the college level gives you this breadth of experience dealing with players at different ages, players of different genders, 
different situations, all of which helps you to become a better coach in each new situation that you move into, which leads us to what you're doing with Thrive on Challenge and J.P. Nurbin and Nate Sanderson and how you got connected to both of them and what they're trying to do, what their mission is, and then why that mission aligned with your career goals. And just talk a little bit about how you got connected to them and what your role is in the organization and why it's so important to you. Well, you know, ever since, you know, I've always been a reader, all that kind of stuff. And um, a number of years ago, man, it must have been seven or eight years ago, as I was just doing all this reading, I started reading books by all these authors talking about, you know, having a mentor in your life and started seeing different organizations pop up where they were offering like this one-on-one type of coaching relationship. And it was mostly in the sporting realm with, with sport coaches of, hey, you know, you, you hire us to work with you and we'll support you through whatever, however long you hire them for. But it basically, you know, we're going to be available for phone calls. You know, now it's, now it's like, you know, Skype or Zoom or whatever. Um, but we're going to give you like different homework. We're going to be there to just basically professional development in a one-on-one relationship and somebody to work with you, um, throughout a season when you need that support. And I always found it was like a third party who's not a close friend or a family member, but just somebody who can look at things objectively and you just share, here's what's going on in my program. Here's what I'm struggling with, or here's what's going really well. Like, what would you recommend? Or just somebody to vent to. It's like, I'm pissed off this week and everything's going to crap and you can just vent and then they can just be there for you, you know? Um, So that like, I'd read, numerous guys doing this and so i'd wanted to do this for a while and then two years ago i was making the switch i was from you know coaching high school varsity boys to and being a vice principal and made the switch and applied and got the men's this men's coaching um the men's head coaching job here at briarcrest and i was making that switch and i was like man i as i'm making this big life change i was 39 at the time be like it's kind of like my midlife crisis i'm i'm switching making this big big career change <laughs> been going for it and I was like man i'd really like to to work with somebody and hire hire a mentor who's doing this and so a friend of mine knew jp he's like hey buddy of mine jp just started this business called thrive on challenge and he's just he's he's podcasting he's writing articles and it's all just coaching resources and he's starting to work with coaches one-on-one um you should give him a call and i was like Sh- sure let's see you know just starting out that kind of excited me like i don't know i just kind of like the idea of somebody just getting going with this and gave jp a call and we hit it off and we talked for like two two and a half hours and he just wanted to know my story and where i'm at and where i'm going and all that kind of stuff and so he really helped me transition just you know putting in different systems with our team culturally um you know everything from just how we run our practices um, to the way we run our, uh, how we set up our captains, you know, how I communicate um, and then just, you know, different, just personal growth stuff. Like for me, it was, you know, confidence, um, you know, and just being there to help me grow personally in areas where I just need to grow. Um, And it was an absolute game changer. So after, man six months he had a pretty big impact on our on our program we flew him over he was in in the states at the time he came he worked with our program in year one um for a couple days guys loved it just really helped us get things going culturally and 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 setting a strong foundation and uh yeah at the at the end of that year he asked he was running two podcasts and he just said hey would you be interested in taking over one of the podcasts and it's just a short little two three minute leadership nugget for coaches he's like i think it'd be good for you just to keep growing yourself and so took that over it's called culture builders and yeah you can find that and then he just really encouraged me to start writing so um you know written a few few articles for the website and then this past uh january got to work with my first high school coach um in a one-on-one mentor mentorship um capacity and basically what that looked like was for for three months we'd We'd Skype every week and we'd call and, you know, I'd passed on different resources and documents and books and just different things that we've done with our program culturally, systematically. Um, you know, we went through some books together. 
and was just there to support each other, right? Like through every game and just text messages, send each other, you know, podcasts, encouragement. And it's just somebody walking through a season with you, um, guiding you all the way. And uh, in every single situation that I've been, you know, JP and I are pretty good friends now. Um, you know, he's had a huge impact on me, not just my coaching, but, you know, my relationships, you know, with my kids and my spouse, all that kind of stuff, just because um, it's just been a, a sweet relationship that way of just helping me know who I am, why I do what I do, and bring me back to those things consistently. And then he, and then he, he pushes me out of my comfort zone. Like, hey, why don't you try this? Or why don't you consider this? And so, um, yeah, they, they brought me on with their team um, in the fall. And, yeah, it's slowly, slowly been growing. And, you know, JP's been, JP and Nate are fantastic. Like, people listening to this, you know, to check out the website and tons of free resources. Um, but really the heart of what we do is, is that is that one-on-one mentorship. That's the thing that, you know, JP's worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of coaches and, and programs all over North America. And, uh, you know, the fruit is there and just the impact that he's had on these cultures. And so they can do everything from these one-on-one mentorship relationships from a distance to coming on campus for three days and working with your assistant coaches and, um, you know, observing your practices and building in like all sorts, like team built, whatever you want. Like there's just, it's really endless, but you just, our whole focus is, we want to be there for other coaches and just to resource them and help equip them to be the best they can be. Um, and like we said earlier tonight, I think a lot of coaches are just trying to go it on their own. Um, and, you know, that's the heart for this is how can we help coaches just be better at what they're doing and help give them the support they need, whether their season is going really good or, or really badly on the scoreboard. Um, and so, We've worked with everybody from high school to Division One, um, and even like some corporations, like like professionals outside of sports. So um, it's a pretty, I don't know, it's transformed my my life, my coaching career. I love it. Um, I tell everybody about it. Um, it's fantastic. I know JP was a guest earlier a few weeks ago, so you know for people to check out that episode. And so um, yeah, so that's kind of that in a in a nutshell but yeah thrive on challenge.com it's uh it's 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 a pretty sweet site and tons of resources there absolutely it's great stuff jp's episode was fantastic as we're talking that episode is already out last wednesday night we talked to nate and his episode will be out before yours comes out but shortly and it's both episodes have a tremendous amount of value for coaches as does yours so before we we just past the hour and a half mark so i want to give you a chance before we wrap up to just let people know where they can find you social media website you already mentioned the thrive on challenge stuff go ahead and reiterate that just let people know where they can find out more about all the great stuff you're doing and then i'll jump back in and wrap up the episode perfect well um yeah shane stout i'm the head coach at briarcrest college men's basketball um you can find me on twitter at Coach Souden, that might be the best place to uh, to find me. Um, email, you know, I don't know if you want to put that in the show notes. You can put my email on there as well. Would love to hear from you. Um, yeah, doing that. The Culture Builders podcast. Um, there's articles on Thrive On Challenge. All our informations, all our information's there. So, um, yeah, we love we love hearing from coaches. Um, with you know feedback, and we just love connecting with coaches. And if that's something people are interested in. Um, that would be great. You know, and there's, there's one other thing I want to throw in here. Uh, just a little plug is up here in Canada. Um, we get three international, uh, spots to give away only three. And, um, it's a lot, it's pretty cheap when you cross that border, when you take the American dollar and then turn into the Canadian dollar. But we've, we've had a few Americans up here playing last year have had really good experiences. And so, um, yeah, if, if there's coaches listening, to this um, from a recruiting perspective and you know, they're looking for a place to play Canada is a great place to to come play and experience a different culture um, and we're you know I'm I'm currently looking for a place but I mean one more player for next year um, who's an international player so yeah if somebody wants to reach out through either just on Twitter or, or email there would love to hear from you terrific that would be fantastic coaches out there take Shane up on his offer 
There's so much good stuff that Shane, JP, and Nate are doing with Thrive On Challenge. I would highly recommend you check out their Culture Builders podcast. Make sure you check out the website. They've got a tremendous amount of free resources, a lot of great articles on what it takes to build a positive team culture, develop leadership within your team. It's great stuff. Shane, we can't thank you enough for spending an hour and a half with us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think there's a ton of value in our conversation for coaches. Plus, we got a chance to talk a little Michael Jordan, which is always good. (laughs) So uh, I want to just thank you personally and to everyone out there. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.